The president is about to speak in the East Room of the White House. He is unveiling the My Brother's Keeper initiative, which is designed to help young men and boys of color. Now, Attorney General Eric Holder was supposed to be there as well, but as we've reported today, he was taken to the hospital earlier. Now, he is in good condition. The event is going to continue as planned, and if we hear more on that, we'll let you know as well as what we'll hear from the president. Now, the campaign is, of course, a result of a task the president gave his senior staff in the wake of the Trayvon Martin shooting to come up with a holistic approach to helping young minority boys succeed and also avoid violence. Trayvon Martin was shot and killed by George Zimmerman two years ago this week. Now, Zimmerman claimed self-defense, and he was acquitted of second-degree murder in a Florida courtroom in July. Questions about the verdict and the, and the way that case was handled, however, linger to this day. Now, before we bring in our guest, a legal note. Zimmerman has sued NBC Universal for defamation, and the company strongly denies that allegation. Legal analyst Lisa Bloom covered the trial for MSNBC, and she's out with a new book, Suspicion Nation, the inside story of the Trayvon Martin injustice and why we continue to repeat it. Strong words in the title, strong words in the book. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ari. I want to start with how America observed this trial, because like so many trials, while it excavated some very important issues that we continue to discuss, whenever the media covers a trial, the more you watched the trial on TV, the more what you understand about what's happening departs from what the jury understands and what mm -hmm. the jury is exposed to under our rules and limits. Mm. How did that dynamic play out in this trial, a trial which many people, of course, watched. I think that's a very insightful observation. And I begin my book inside the jury room with a lot of new information about exactly what happened there. This jury was sequestered for three weeks. And I tell the story of Maddie, the only non-white juror who was in this case, and how she felt ostracized, demeaned, mm -hmm. and ultimately felt that her voice was taken away. So that when she went into deliberations, she didn't have the strength to advocate for her position, which was for a conviction. Mm -hmm. And others agreed agreed with her that conviction was probably the right outcome, but they didn't have the facts and law to back it up. And ultimately, I don't blame this jury. I blame the professionals in the courtroom. And if you've looked at the book, you know I come down very hard on them. But I agree with you. Inside the jury room is really the key to this case. And that's why I start there. Yeah. Uh, on that point, though, about uh, juror B29, she was the only minority of the group of six women. And, and she did mention that as a mother, she was very conflicted in her heart and in her head. I actually want to take a listen to what she had to say. I feel that I was forcefully included in Trayvon Martin's death. I carry him on my back by the law, and the way it was followed is the way I went. But if I would have used my heart, I probably would have went a hung jury. Hmm. So she thought Zimmerman was guilty, but under the law, she could not vote guilty. How did the prosecution right. lose when you say this was theirs to lose? Right. This was a very winnable case. And, you know, I felt in my gut as I was watching this case day to day for MSNBC that something was very wrong. In fact, the original title of my book was What Went Wrong? Because mm. I wanted to show America how very off the rails this case went. Um, I was concerned, though, that I didn't want to overstate. I didn't know everything as I was watching it in real time. And so I wanted, after this trial was over, and I just really couldn't put it behind me, to do new investigation, to do new interviews. Maddie has become my friend. Mm -hmm. I tell her story. She's trusted me. She and I are texting all the time, even today, um, because she feels that she bears the weight of Trayvon Miles' <sighs> death on her shoulders to <sighs> this day. The prosecution, I, I have the top six errors that they made in this case. Uh, they, they did just a terrible job. I don't know any other way of saying it. I was trying to be charitable as I was covering it day to day, but they bungled the case so badly. For example, they asked questions in closing arguments instead of connecting the dots. No prosecutor does that. Mm -hmm. They never came up with a theory of the case. They didn't put on expert witnesses who were begging to testify on the scientific evidence. They didn't prepare important witnesses like Rachel Gentile or their own medical examiner. examiner. There's no excuse for that. In this case, this was a high-profile case. Right. They should have had more resources not fewer resources. Well, was it just a pure case of incompetence or was there some reason why they performed so poorly? So that's the ultimate question and in, I think I really want to leave that to the to the reader of my book to come to their own conclusion about that. In my opinion, this was not intentional on their part, but I think they never believed in this case. And I also think that they had the same attitudes about Trayvon Martin that many others had, that he probably was the aggressor. I think there were assumptions made him based on skin color by everyone in that courtroom, including the prosecutor, the judge, and the defense. Mm. Well, and let's talk a little bit about the stand-your-ground law, which was a factor 
in this case. One of the things that's hard for me to understand is essentially withstand your ground. There's no duty to retreat, and you just have to prove that you were afraid, right? So it's a sort of subjective mental state. So how do you apply that as a law? How do you handle that as a juror? So it should be hard for you to understand because you're a woman with a conscience and a heart. And of course, anyone should have to retreat rather than commit an act of violence if that's possible. I mean, that's what our hearts tell us. That's what the Michael Dunn jurors wanted in the loud music case, but they couldn't find it in the law. We know in that case, they were looking through the jury instructions, trying to find something that comported with that basic sense of human decency, right. and it wasn't there. And stand your ground, in fact, says that you don't have the duty to retreat, but it also still has has important requirements before you take a human life. There are three key elements to self-defense, uh, which I go through in the book. I talk about how prosecutors should have handled it, how they didn't. I mean, probably the most important part was you have to be in reasonable fear of great bodily injury or death, not a panicked fear, as Zimmerman says. He admits that he was panicked. Panic is not reasonable fear. I mean, these are the essential arguments that any courtroom lawyer should have made yeah. that weren't made here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Lisa, I should mention, as, as we told our viewers earlier in the hour, we are going to go to the president uh, soon. Soon. He's going to be coming out speaking live on this uh, My Brother's Keeper initiative. We may have to interrupt you uh, when very he comes important out. Initiative. Um, and one, as we mentioned, that is somewhat related to this discussion. Mm. On that point, though, that you talk about, you use that word, injustice. Mm. How much of this from your reporting is what went wrong? You say your original title, the way this particular case came down. And to Crystal's point, I think, and the larger way our justice system works, how much of it is baked into a system? where the juries that we select are disproportionately not reflective of these communities. Well, that's where the, where the, some of these laws not only stand your ground, but several of these laws are applied in ways that we know from the data are racially, dis, racially disproportionate. Are you talking about one case that went wrong or one case that elucidates something wrong with the way we run our courts? This case was really a microcosm for so much that's wrong in our criminal justice system. And ultimately, while it's very easy to demonize George Zimmerman, I challenge all of us, including myself, to look at our own racial biases because it's not just one case. There's no question that the criminal justice system is probably the most racially biased place in America. Mm. And how sad and ironic that that is the wow. place where everyone should get an mm. equal shake but there's mountains of studies and I have many of them in the book that there's no question that if you show up with white skin in our criminal justice system you're going to do better in terms of what neighborhood is policed my neighborhood for example a white suburban neighborhood in Los Angeles is very lightly policed compared to African-American urban neighborhoods and that's true in every city in America if I'm arrested for let's say marijuana possession it's very unlikely that anything serious would happen to me compared to many African-Americans who are in for five or ten year mandatory minimum sentences and on and on in every corner of our criminal justice system if you shine a light you're going to find racial bias and how sad that is where the institutions have the scales of justice and Lady Liberty blindfolded you know this is just one case but this is an important case I'm glad we all looked at it yeah. so closely and I wanted to expose what really we're gonna, happened. I appreciate that the book is Suspicion Nation as I mentioned we are now turning live to the East Room of the White House where President Obama was just introduced he's speaking on the My Brother's Keeper initiative designed to help uh, young African-American and Latino men, young men in communities of color. He's getting, as you can see, uh, a, a pretty, pretty long and loud applause there in the room. Let's go ahead and listen in and see what the president has to say today.